In many chemistry applications, we may have a need to know the concentration of some chemical species within the system. A popular way to do this in combustion research is laser absorption spectroscopy using Beer's Law. I'm not going to dive into the specifics of absorption spectroscopy here, but the basic idea is that if you have a laser that produces a beam of light at a specific wavelength and you have a gas sample where you expect to find a specific species that absorbs light at that wavelength in a known way, then when you pass the beam through your sample, some of the light will be absorbed and a slightly smaller intensity will come out the other side. So what I'm showing here is a gas sample cell of length L filled with some unknown concentration X of my species of interest. The sample cell has windows on each side so that it which allows a laser beam to be passed through. The beam has some initial intensity, I naught, and after some amount of the beam is absorbed in the sample, a slightly lower transmitted intensity, I sub t, passes out the other end. Assuming we know some other properties of the sample and the species of interest, we can use Beer's Law to determine x from I sub t and I naught. Beer's Law is also referred to as the Beer-Lambert Law, and it states that the absorptive capacity of a dissolved substance is directly proportional to its concentration in a solution. And you may have seen Beer's Law written like this on Wikipedia, where A is the absorbents. In other cases, you may see absorbents as alpha. Epsilon is called the absorptivity, uh, which is also sometimes referred to as the molar extinction coefficient or the molar absorption coefficient. L is the path length, and recall that I am using a capital L for my path length. C is the species concentration, and recall that I am using a capital X for species concentration. So if we have a mixture with our species gas of interest at some unknown concentration, and we solve Beer's law for that concentration X, it looks like this, which is fine in theory, but I'm an experimentalist, so I prefer to have all of my equations written in terms of measurands and known constants. That is, things that I can directly measure with some instrumentation and then constants that I am given. And so, in order to put Beer's Law into that form, we need to make two changes. First, we need to write absorbance, alpha, in terms of initial and final intensities. And the definition of absorbance is the negative natural log of the transmitted light intensity over the initial light intensity. So let's think about the mathematical meaning of that for a second. IT over I0 can take any value from 0 where the transmitted intensity is zero. So that means that all of the light was absorbed in the sample all the way up to one where IT is equal to I naught. So that means that none of the initial intensity was absorbed in the signal. And the value of alpha then, the negative natural log of I I naught is going to look like this, where the natural log of 1 is just 0. And that makes sense. If none of the initial intensity was absorbed, then the absorbance is 0. If all of the transmitted, in, excuse me, if all of the initial intensity was absorbed and nothing got through, then your absorbance is infinity. And note that as we get to... Uh, as we're changing our transmitted intensity down by orders of magnitude, that's where we're seeing large changes in our absorbance. Another thing to think about here is that presumably you're using some sort of a light detector to determine the transmitted intensity. And that means that as absorbance goes up, the signal going into your detector is going down significantly, but presumably the noise from that detector is going to be the same. So that means that as absorbance goes from a low number to a high number, your signal to noise ratio is getting lower and lower and lower. And you're going to have a very high noise relative to your signal when your transmitted intensity is very low. And that is when you have a lot of your 
species, uh, a very high concentration of your species in your sample cell. The second change I need to make is that, at least for combustion problems, I don't know where to find the absorptivity of any of my combustion species. So I need to replace absorptivity with a thing called the absorption cross-section. And those two things are related like this. The absorptivity is equal to the absorption cross-section times the molar number density, where the molar number density is just the total number of moles per unit volume. And you recall that these two things are related to each other via the ideal gas law, which is usually written PV equals NRT. So uh, do the algebra yourself. You'll see that uh, this relationship at the end is correctly. So I take this relationship at the far right and I plug it into Beer's law to get the expression here on the right where the green variables have been plugged in in place of absorptivity. Now, this might seem like a bit of a sideways move because absorption cross-section doesn't really seem like any more of an intuitive quantity than absorptivity. It's just that I know of databases that I can go to to find absorption cross-section. I don't know where I can find absorptivity absorptivity for the species that I'm interested in. If you can, then go ahead and stick with this expression and forget about that conversion to absorption cross-section. For now, let's summarize Beer's law and add some units to this. So the concentration of your species that you're trying to measure, which is in moles of the species over total moles of your sample gas, is equal to the transmitted intensity over the initial intensity. And light intensity is typically measured in watts per meter squared, or some people would say uh, perhaps candelas. And here I've listed this as volts. And the reason for that is that presumably you're going to measure this intensity using some kind of a light detector. And that light detector will probably output a signal in voltage, which is proportional to the input intensity. And so that proportion is going to be the same for both the initial and transmitted intensity. And in the end, you've got transmitted over uh, initial anyway, so those units are going to cancel out. So I prefer to just maintain it in the units that I'm going to measure directly, which is, for my setups anyway, volts. Um, the absorption cross-section is in moles per meter squared. Often this is reported in moles per centimeter squared, but you'll notice that I have pressure in pascals, which is kilogram meter per second squared, the universal gas constant, which is in joules per mole Kelvin. And again, if you convert that to uh, base units, it's kilograms meter squared times moles times Kelvin times second squared. Temperature is in Kelvin and length is in meters. So everything needs to be in meters uh, in order for the units to work out. So now to just make sure that we've put everything in the correct units and they work out the way they want, let's just go ahead and plug our units in to the equation where their variables are and make sure that yes, in fact, our units do cancel out. This is a quick exercise and it's worth it just to make sure that we're on the right track. Volts and volts cancel out. Kelvin and Kelvin cancels out. Meter squared and meter squared cancels out. Meters and meters cancel out. Kilograms and kilograms cancel out. Second squared and second squared canceled out. And what we're left with is moles per mole. So finally, we have Beer's Law in the form that we want it, and we can apply it to a practical system. So the question is, how do we determine each of these variables listed on the right? Let's start with the easiest ones first. R is the universal gas constant. I have already told you the value of that. L has already been measured. You could use a ruler for all I care to determine that. Temperature is measured with a thermocouple. Pressure is measured with a pressure transducer. Absorption cross-section is actually a function of the species of interest being measured, the temperature, the pressure, and the wavelength of light being absorbed. And we're going to assume that's given to us. Now, this is not a simple quantity to determine because it changes for each species, temperature, pressure, and wavelength of light. So you got to get this from a database. You can find absorption cross-sections for a number of species in high tran and high temp, and you may also be able to search for it in journal articles. So if we just put a detector on the far side of our sample, 
that gives us the transmitted intensity. So now how do you get the initial intensity? You can't put a detector over here, that would block the beam. Also, even when you have the same model of detector from the same manufacturer made in the same factory, it's conversion of light from inten intensity of light to a voltage output is going to be slightly different from detector to detector. So you'd really like to measure it transmitted and initial intensity using the same detector. And that's actually very easy. All you have to do is vacuum the gas sample cell down to where there is nothing in there and nothing to absorb the signal. And at that point, now the transmitted intensity is the initial intensity. The other value of this is that A, you have the same signal set from the same detector, so the conversion is automatically the same. Also, any kind of absorption or reflection of that laser signal that might have happened at the windows or laser alignment or anything else is automatically accounted for here. So this eliminates a lot of sources of potential signal change that aren't actually due to a change in the sample concentration. So that's it. The transmitted intensity over the initial intensity is equal to the intensity measured when we have a sample over the intensity measured when we have a vacuum. However, it's important to note that the setup I show here fails to account for a number of error sources in our signal. The best example of that is the fact that the sample intensity has to be measured at a different time than the vacuum intensity. They can't be measured simultaneously. And that fails to account for slight variations that might occur in our laser uh, output. So if the laser output isn't perfectly constant with time, which it is not, then there is going to be some error in this due to natural laser variation. So an actual absorption spectroscopy setup using Beer's Law in a shock tube specifically looks something like this. This is the shock tube test section. It's a hollow tube with window pairs placed around the circumference. Let's say we have a mixture of some hydrocarbon fuel with air in here and we want to measure the fuel concentration as it is consumed by combustion with the air. So inside this metal tube there is a fuel whose concentration is decreasing and we'd like to record that change in concentration over time. So we get a laser that outputs a beam of light at a single wavelength that we know our fuel will absorb. We direct the beam into a beam splitter which sends some of the light into what I call a pitch detector. The pitch detector's only job is to record changes in the laser output so that they can be corrected for in the catch detector signal. That's called common mode rejection. The shock wave that causes combustion in the shock tube may cause some signal variation due to beam steering, which can be partially corrected for using a focusing lens whose focal point is at the center of the tube. Directing the beam into a couple of mirrors helps guarantee that only the directed light from the laser makes it to the detector. Spatial variation in the beam can be corrected for using an iris, and a wavelength filter rejects all light that is not at or near the wavelength of interest. I hope to discuss some of these methods in more detail in a future video. I hope this video has made the practical application of Beer's Law more clear. Thanks for listening.